We're on the internet. On the interwebs. <laughs> How high tech is this? This is crazy. Pretty awesome. Yeah. All right. right so our first venture into uh, Facebook Live for the new Fly Fisher, and from what I've learned in being with you for the last yeah. 15 for, minutes, first drift as well. Yeah, yeah. So be gentle. Be gentle. We're, uh, we're learning here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, the reason why we're doing this is, um, there's a couple of reasons why we're doing this. Number one is I want to start a regular conversation about fly fishing, wherever we happen to be while we're uh, shooting the new fly fisher or working with, with partners such as yourself for the new fly fisher. And engagement with you is the entire reason for why we want to do this. So um, the first question I'll put out to everybody is what works best for the masses is should we do this Mondays at noon, Wednesdays at noon, when is is it going to be most convenient do you think for people that's a great question um everyone's busy these days that's a hard one that's a really hard uh, question to answer there. and do people even take lunches anymore <laughs> no i don't it's a working <laughs> lunch i'm uh, eating talking to customers it's uh, it's not a great right, scenario right, right. uh so. but i think yeah i think uh you know mondays people are busy uh, mm -hmm. get back to work get back into the seats um, of their work and sort of uh, you know getting down to it so maybe wednesdays hump day i think hump day is a yeah, good idea hump day? i think hump, yeah. hump day is a great idea so yeah. so th for those of you who may not know this is rob sesta rob is the um owner purveyor of drift outfitters in downtown toronto also floor washer and stock boy and yeah. jazz, <laughs> coffee so. maker just like, <laughs> yeah. kind of like us yeah um rob's been at at this for a number of years now and it's a fantastic full service fly shop guide shop as well servicing uh southern ontario and everybody on the interwebs so it's uh it's a fantastic shop i live 15, 15 minutes away from here and um you know in a pinch whenever there's an emergency you're always here to help so yeah, thank you for that so we're here for big yeah time. yeah so the, the the one of the great things about drift being where it's located a lot of people think well it's located in downtown toronto i mean the armory is right across the street oh yeah yeah scene tower is a couple kilometers away exactly yeah. um you know but the the real question is is you know you're in an urban center how's the fly fishing i mean how's the fishing in this area i mean Really? Yeah. Is it is it good? Is it enough to support your business? Clearly, it is. Yeah, no, most definitely. There, there's a lot around. It's uh, it's amazing what does exist in Toronto. You know, from, you know, believe it or not, the Don River, which is about three, four kilometers to our east, gets a run of salmon and steelhead. Yeah. You know, it's a bit of an under the radar type thing. There's not many fish in there, but there are some, and mm -hmm. you know, for a quiet day to go fish. Uh, you can get head out there. The Humber River, which is about eight kilometers to our west, has a great run of salmon and steelhead as well. There's great carp fishing down there. Yeah. Um, you know, Toronto Harbor is chock full of huge, huge carp, like massive 30 to 40 pound carp that no one ever really fishes for. It's, right. a, bit of, it's a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, you know, the pike down there is super selective, but they're big pike. And uh, really, within an hour's drive, you're into some great trout rivers, uh, great trout streams. Within a two-hour drive, even more, three-hour drive, even more. So, so yeah, for yeah. day trips, weekend trips, there's a lot to do around here. And we have every species. We have warm water, cold water. We have, um, you name it, we've got it. We're, we're very, very lucky around here. And what I like about it is, again, living just you know a couple, couple minutes away from the shop, is that at any time, at any time during the year, if there's a species that you can target, um, the... The carp fishing is literally world class. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and carp is being is really making such a uh, an impact in mm -hmm. North America now. You know, some people have started their own guiding businesses, calling it the Golden Bonefish. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it, they're hard. They're hard to catch. So yeah, yeah. Well, that's on another post there. Yeah. Uh, for yeah, carp are one of those fish species that we really get people to um, angle for throughout the year. Yeah. If you're a bone fisherman, um, if you're into saltwater fishing, it's huge training for um, your your flats experience. Mm -hmm. um, you get down to the flats, you need to sight fish, uh, you need to spot fish, you need to cast to fish well, accurately, quickly, and you're doing the exact same thing with carp. So yeah. why wouldn't you train in the freshwater yeah. uh, for with the golden bones yeah. or the silver bones down south? And they're yeah. huge. They're, they're big. Absolutely yeah, huge. they pull. Um, I was in. A in a, in a pontoon with a buddy down on the spit and we got into a fish maybe 12 13 14 pounds and yeah. he had his eight weights buckled over uh he's like yeah it's not fighting too hard i'm like ellis look back like there's a weight behind her boat and this thing was pulling us <laughs> and pulling us and he was like oh yeah Oops. yeah yeah that's great yeah. so you had a uh, uh last weekend we premiered the show that you and bill spicer did yes uh targeting uh browns and rainbows here in southern ontario mm -hmm. can you tell us uh, a little bit about what that experience was like, and yeah. and uh, was that your first TV show ever? It was the first TV show I've been on, for sure. Right. Uh, maybe like a short clip on the news for something, you know, right. way back when. 
Uh, but this was a uh, very different experience. It was not easy. Um, uh, you know, hats off to you guys. You make it look easy on camera. Mm -hmm. uh, from you know, sort of structuring what you want to say to where you want to go, what you want to do. Um, it's, it's 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 quite the task. Um, now we definitely dealt with some pretty tough conditions for the first two days. Mm -hmm. uh, Bluebird days. Um, it was absolutely sunny as heck. Uh, the water was super super clear. Yeah. And we really had um, tough conditions to fish. So we had to be a little smarter. We had to fish differently. Um, and we were able to produce. Some great fish with the camera, which I was super happy about. Definitely, yeah. there's a bit of sweat coming down a few times. So. <laughs> there is pressure, yeah. isn't there? So there that is, leads yeah. that leads to the first question that we got from one of our viewers, um, uh, Mike from Collingwood said, uh, "You said that it was tough conditions during a bluebird day. Um, what about bluebird conditions makes it difficult for?" to catch and release yeah. rainbows and browns. Uh, so a big part of that is that fish don't have eyelids. So they're being bombarded by the sun the entire day. So imagine on a uh, sunny day, you couldn't never close your eyes. And yeah. so what do you do? You basically bury yourself in the bottom. You try to find some shade, you bury yourself in there. Um, and those fish just don't want to come out and play. Um, I wouldn't want to. Yeah. You know, I wear polarized sunglasses. My eyes get even even uh, fatigued with those. Um, so really it's, it's, it's about tough conditions, uh, too much light. Um, and you know you're, you cast huge shadows in the water. Um, there's spooky fish at that point as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, now, is there is there an issue that you find with birds of prey too on sunny days that they're they're able to see better? Oh, that, yeah. that yeah. you know talon talon toting animals can yes, come yeah. down and we grab. We call that the death from above factor. <laughs> uh, where <clears throat> good imagine, band name. <laughs> yeah, it's a great band name. So if you imagine that you are a small little fish in a river or a creek and your entire life you've been running away from things that want to kill you and you are, you're yeah. low in the totem pole. Yeah. Um, so a flash, a shadow, a glint, a glimmer of something that's different, even on the bank of the river, it could be a raccoon, you know, swiping at you. Um, there's that factor too. So any any bird that flies over, casts a shadow, your fly rod casting a shadow, your fly line casting a shadow, yeah. Yeah. all those things can actually make those bluebird days even more difficult. So you got to be really strategic in how you approach, longer leaders, stay away from the edge of the bank, uh, you know, cast upstream to a fish, putting your leader way over top, or staying way above a fish upriver and actually feeding line down to a fish with mm -hmm. a cast too. Um, there's tricks you can um, you can use to make your, your chances of easier to, or better to catch a fish, but those are the toughest conditions. I would rather fish on a howling, windy, blowing day than right. a bluebird day myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if if you haven't seen the episode uh, that Rob and Bill did, it's on uh, YouTube. It's on the New Fly Fisher YouTube channel. Um, already, I mean, it, we posted it on Saturday morning. Today's Monday, yep. and it's up over seven. I think it's close, it's to, close 7, to seven thousand, yeah. if not over seven thousand views yeah. already. So, um, but what I like about that is is the tips and techniques that you portrayed during those tough conditions mm -hmm. are all there for you to watch. So you can go back and you can pick that video apart on YouTube and see exactly what Rob and Bill did to uh, to be able to fool these very, very wary trout. Yep, yep. right on. So you missed a giant. I did. <laughs> that was really cool. It was a lot of fun. It was, that, yeah. that was a big, big brown. Oh yeah, that was, that was not small. That uh, thing scared the hell out of me, to be honest. <laughs> um, I've never had a fish jump at me um, like that ever in my entire life. That's not the one I'm talking about. No, no, no. The, the big, the brig brown, the one that's... The big uh, one. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that one. The one that looked like it was that thick. <laughs> that's a tall, tall fish. Yeah. Yeah, another fish that scared me as well. So what happened there? Uh, so we were um, fishing the section of the river with streamers, uh, walking down river, um, swinging and stripping. And, uh, you know, we went to a spot that looked super fishy, super deep, darker water, uh, water that monsters can live in, type mm -hmm. of stuff. And... Uh, so put a streamer through, you know, got it down a bit, you know, did that many technique where you add some slack to your line, let the fly deepen, and strip, 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 and this big, big flash comes up. Now, a big brown like that may eat your fly. Um, it, it may or may not. It may flash on it to say, get the heck away from me. So did that fish actually eat? It did. Uh, I felt a tug. I felt a pull. Um, so that thing did commit to the fly, grabbed it, but it could have been also a warning, like a, a love bite, if you want right. to call it that. Um, so that fish did take, you see that even the line straighten and pull, mm -hmm. um, and then it just let go. It would have felt the metal, the flash. Um, right. It's very unnatural. Flies a very unnatural thing in the, fly, in the fish's mouth. Yeah. So it would have uh, felt it and said, nah, that's not real. I went for a spit. So interesting. Steve from Denver <clears throat> asked that question. Once that fish tastes the flash and the metal, yeah. is it done for the day? It might be. Um, you, there's always a chance that fish could come back for a second go. Um, my advice is to rest that fish. Don't cast it right away. Um, just hold back. Uh, you know, reel in some line or walk up river maybe 20, 30 feet. Uh, mm -hmm. Give it some time to settle down and get back into its natural sort of uh, feeding lane. Um, maybe change your fly. Go to a smaller fly and repeat what you just did because it's, it's interested. It's aggressive. It's there. And if that fish... Um, 
this is a potential main take again, you have to maybe approach it with new tactics. Uh, right. And even just a slight modification of a tactic um, to go maybe get that fish back again. So you're fishing bluebird days, <clears throat> bluebird skies, uh, yep. tough fishing conditions. Mm -hmm. I had to laugh a little bit at you when um, you referred to a indicator as a suspension device. I did. That's that, a bobber. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty yeah. funny, actually. Yeah. And I know on social media you got a little bit of ribbing for that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So suspension devices um, are bobbers. And I use bobbers. I'm happy to use them. Um, there's a time and a place for them. Yeah. Um, so we definitely we definitely utilize them and, and love them in the shop. But not for all, all situations. Right. Uh, actually, I think there was a question regarding uh, indicators and cider uh, that we got from one of the uh, audience members or uh, it was a pre-email here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Janine. Yeah. From Fergus. When you use cider, when would you use cider material over an indicator? Cool. That's a great question. Um, with the the popularity of Euro nymphing and uh, advanced nymphing tactics, that's something that we are definitely getting a lot more questions about and selling a lot more is an indicator tippet, which is two toned. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. So. For myself, when I look at the use of an indicator or a bobber, um, an air lock, whatever it may be, I think I'm a bobber, um, what we usually do is um, I use those in scenarios where the fish are holding quite far away from me uh, mm -hmm. and in deeper water. Um, that's where I find indicators um, really, or a suspension device really does uh, thrive. Yeah. Um, in the closer quarters, you know, up to 30 or 40 feet away with a longer rod, um, uh, indicator piece of tippet, so that two-tone material is super, super sensitive. So when you do hold your rod out quite high, have it off the water and the fish even just kind of dabbles at your fly, it, it actually will get that little vibration cue through your line. Mm -hmm. um, so make a, a very long answer short, I would say in the scenarios that the fish are closer to you and in shallower water, mm -hmm. even in deeper water close to you, it works better, but far, further away you would want to use, and deeper water, use suspension devices. Yeah, another question about indicators is um, from Jen from Toronto here. Uh, indicators, what are your favorite indicators to use and why? So I, I'm going to jump in on this one because um, unfortunately you're sold out of my favorite indicator. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which doesn't surprise me, but this is uh, an airlock. Um, I, I like airlocks and I like th uh, thingamabobbers um, because of one reason is that you can buy them, I call it in a smoke color, mm -hmm. yep. which is actually translucent, which allows light to pass through it mm -hmm. and it literally looks like a bubble. Yep. So as you know, when you're fishing trout, if you're fishing anything in moving water, where the bubbles run is where the food runs. Mm -hmm. So when you place the indicator in the bubble line or in the foam line, um, you want it to look as natural as possible. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, on a bright day, this would stand out big time. Yep. Uh, same with different colors. So I generally go with a smoke color or a translucent mm -hmm. uh, thingamabob bobber or or airlock. Yep. That's what about a, you? That's a great tip. Um, I'm definitely towards that uh, that facet as well. I don't think white is as obtrusive as other colors. It is mm -hmm. opaque, so it will cast a shadow, mm -hmm. and it will there will be something above the fish the fish may see. And I've seen fish part ways um, underneath, like a school of fish steelhead will part ways underneath an indicator and come back to the resting spot once the indicator passes by them. It's kind of like the parting of the Red Sea. These things just move away and come yeah. back in again because they're seeing the shadow, they're seeing this thing above them. Um, so when we do get the, air, the, the clear smoke-colored airlocks back in, those will be my best for sure. Right. Um, now, in terms of the colors though, they're the hardest to see. So if you're fishing at a distance in low light periods, mm -hmm. it's nearly impossible to see a clear indicator, um, you know, 30, 40 feet away when it's getting dark. Yeah. So you got to pick your indicator color appropriately to your conditions. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, yeah, that's kind of there. But yeah, air locks are my absolute favorite. Uh, the biggest reason why, uh, along with that, they're you know quite useful. They're buoyant. Uh, they're a variety of sizes. Is that you can change your depth. Uh, without kinking up your leader material. Right. Um, other uh, other varieties, I'm not going to name drop other names or bash them, but yep. uh, you have to kink up your leader material by by threading them through and wrapping around. These ones, is a gasket. There's a small slit in, uh, where the gasket is, mm -hmm. and you can adjust as you go. Um, they're so easy. It's an immediate change. You're not straightening at your leader again. They're a really, really great uh, great tool. The only tip I would suggest with, with an airlock um, is make sure that when you do put your, your indicator on your leader, that you do it on terra firma. Do it, do it on the ground because yep. these, the gasket and the and the little spin head here, does get a little bit of little fiddly. Um, uh, and that said, you know they're they're great. You know this or a thing of a bobber are, yep. are fantastic. Absolutely. Now what about uh, those? Um, you see them on social media a lot of time. The the New Zealand. Uh, 
brand yeah, uh, okay. indicators. So those are in interesting. There's a place for them for sure. Um, they're a very light and sensitive indicator and the other companies make similar ones as well. Mm -hmm. uh, ones you don't need a tool for, you can just put onto your uh, your line as well. Um, like I think Loon has them called the tip toppers. Yeah. Uh, now the New Zealand ones are, are interesting uh, because if you're fishing very, very shallow water or slightly deep water with a very light fly, they're not going, they're going to be very sensitive. If you imagine, um, actually you don't even have to imagine, you just have to realize that this is a, a big air bubble holding up a fly. Mm -hmm. And if you have a fish down here uh, that grabs your fly, the more resistance your indicator gives, uh, the harder it is for the signal to fish down there. So that fish has to put more pressure on your fly to signal that there's a fish right. there. So the lighter you go, if you use yarn or wool, something super, super light, or even a smaller indicator, um, there is less resistance to that fish to signal that it's there. Right. So go as light as you can and go as sensitive as you can. And that's where that New Zealand system, that yarn system comes right. into play. Okay, let's go to back to another question here. Um, Dave from Chicago, Bill mentioned that he was using a 10 foot rod even when he was using it in a smaller river. Mm -hmm. What's the advantage of using a longer rod on, on smaller creeks? Um, uh, and why wouldn't you use a, a, a short foot, like a like an eight foot or a nine foot rod? Okay, for sure, um, that's a great question. So we're seeing a lot of questions around this in the shop uh, because 10 foot three weights or 10 foot two weights, 10 foot four weights and five weights and so on are getting more popular. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at historically uh, bamboo tapers, you're looking at shorter rods because the material was so sloppy in a sense. It didn't recover very well, a lot of tip bounce. And as they had to get those rods more responsive, they would actually cut down the length to make them uh, come to rest quicker. Mm -hmm. So imagine a uh, 11 foot three weight bamboo rod, that thing would just vibrate for days and never stop. And so now with uh, graphite rods and better resins, um, longer graphite rods are as responsive as short uh, rods used to be. Right. Um, so for myself, a 10 foot rod is great. You have more reach, you have more control. Um, you can pick up a line um, at greater distance. Uh, if you have obstructions behind you as well, you can clear them easier with a longer rod. Mm -hmm. And a 10 foot rod gives you more dampening ability as well. So if you're looking at the shock absorbency of a rod, a 10 foot rod will give you more give and more flexibility. Um, so that's what people are going more towards them. And the small streams, you know, a, a one foot difference isn't huge. If you're in tiny, tiny brookie streams or any sort of trout stream that's maybe four or five feet wide, and there's tons of overgrowth, even maybe a larger stream than that, maybe a, a six foot rod or seven foot rod comes into play. But a 10 foot rod has been uh, really popular and we sell uh, considerable more, um, considerably more rods in the 10 foot length than we've ever had in the past. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, back to the show. Why are you not naming the river that you fished for the episode? Hey man, <clears throat> that's not fair. Yeah, that's a big question. We've got, <laughs> we've got a bit about that. People have uh, come up to us for, like individually and like big shout outs on, on social media saying like, where were you guys? Where um, at river? That's what I always say. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> over there. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of rivers in Ontario don't have a lot of catch and lease only protection. Um, and those smaller streams, if we get a few guys out there keeping a fish or two, that's the entire river's full of fish. It's yep. gone. Yep. Um, so we have to be very sensitive to those areas and make sure those uh, opportunities still exist. We have mm -hmm. friends who are guides and a lot of angler friends. And if we gave those names away, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, yep. And it really comes down to it. If we, we need more protected water bodies so we can share more places to fish. Uh, you know, one guy harvesting a fish, it's, that's one meal for a night, but that's a lost opportunity for maybe hundreds of people uh, down the road. So yeah. Not only that, but it, 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 the trickle down economically is huge, right? It is, because yeah. Because it affects yeah. you, yeah. it affects travel. Yeah. Um, hotels, gas hotel, stations. Everything. Yeah, you name it. Everything. Diners, corner stores. Yeah. Um, this is Will from Buffalo. Based on that, what are the trout populations doing in Southern Ontario these days? Oh, that's a big question. That's a big question. Is it? So trout in terms of migratories or trout in terms of like the... Yeah. <laughs> Nerd out. How much time do you got? Let's, let's get our let's, coffees let's, here. Let's relate it back to the to the show that you and Bill did. Let's talk about resident trout okay. um, that are non-migratory. Because we know we can talk about steelhead mm -hmm. on a, another day um, and browns. But... Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, steelhead in the yep. rounds. Um, yeah. But, you know, resi fish, you know, anywhere from, from 8 inches to 12 to 16 inch fish. Okay. What, what, what are they doing these days? Uh, there are lots of them. Um, it really depends on how you fish to find those fish. We get complaints of people saying they can't find big fish. Well, they're there. Um, you know, guys in the shop, Chris, uh, the young gentleman who works for me, uh, and the other boys, we get out there and we fish. And we're kind of finding some really decent fish, like and lots of them. Uh, but it takes advanced skills when... Uh, 
So put it into context here. We have a lot of people near Toronto, a yes. lot of people around Toronto. So if everyone goes out there and starts hacking away at the water, you know, dropping big bobbers out there, lots of split shot, uh, running through pools or fish lives, walking on top of the undercuts, uh, those fish are shut down, they're shut off. So you have to be um, actually more technical these days to catch those larger fish. Mm -hmm. uh, now in terms of uh, year classes, there has been some issues with um, sort of ice up, ice damage, um, you, you name it, sort of happening with some very harsh winters we've had in the past mm -hmm. three or four years. So there's um, there's some fluctuations, but well, this winter's not going to help either. No, no, no. It, it's been a bizarre one. Um, lack of snow, not a lack of snow, a lot of snow, depending on where you may be. Yeah. Um, if you have too much anchor ice, too, going to affect the the bathymic life of the river itself. Um, so there's a lot going on. But I would say overall, the populations of fish are quite good. Mm -hmm. um, you may need to be a little more technical to get those fish. But I think we're in a good state. I would say get out there. Don't don't let the your buddies say he can't catch fish deter you from fishing because they're out there. They're, they're, there's lots out there, trust me. Okay, so a question I get a lot, and I'm sure you do too being a, a fly shop owner, mm -hmm. is um, I want to start fly fishing. What are the first things that I need to do to get started? This is from a vander from here in Toronto. Okay, so that's a good one. Um, I would definitely look at taking a lesson. Um, so sort of reaching out to a local shop or um, an instructor who's been around for a while and asking like, hey, how can I get going? Whether it's a lesson, a group lesson, something towards that effect, because there's a lot of um, skills you need to get right from day one in fly fishing. Yeah. And if you don't get them right, fly fishing becomes very difficult very quickly. Yeah. I'm a great example, to be honest. Um, uh, when I first learned how to fly fish, I was self-taught. I grabbed a rod from Canadian Tire. It was like Abu Garcia. Um, went to the cottage, sort of like flailing away with huge, huge open wrist. I didn't even put backing on my no? fish reel. <laughs> I tied the fly line right to the reel. Yeah, I was we see that a lot in here. We yeah. get reels. You're like, who did this? And you're like, I did it myself. <laughs> well, that's cool. You know, you're, you're learning. We, we'll never judge you for that. But there's, there's a, a better way to do things sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the fact that we see a lot of self-taught people, that's great because they're passionate. They're into it. They stuck with it even through the really hard learning days. Um, so when I'm, uh, to continue my story, it's when I went to guide school when I was in my mid-20s. I went to Montana for a week to the Clark Fork River Guide School, spent about 12 to 13 days out there learning advanced techniques um, for fly fishing um, and casting skill. We um, spent about a day, two days going over casting. Now the first morning I walked out to uh, the river with the, the rod in hand, um, my six weight, and like, okay guys, show me what you got. Mm -hmm. So I walked down, I should put like, trying to lay out some casts, and I thought it was doing pretty well. Yeah. My instructor came over and said, Rob, um, you gotta stop. Try golf. You, you, know, you gotta stop. And like, oh, I was like, oh, I'm pretty good, right? Do you want an example for the crowd? And no, that was not it. I was so bad. Yeah. Um, my wrist was way open. My elbows off to the side. I was tailing loops all the time, and uh, ended up having to strap my arm to my side with his waiter belt, and also strap my wrist to my rod to get myself to have that proper technique. So I had maybe 10 years of really poor technique wow. leading up until that guide school, where it was a big eye opener. Like, oh wow. Like, and as soon as I got my casting in a better place my fishing got way better as well. I could reach those casts, I could find those fish, I yep. could uh, uh, not hurt myself on mm -hmm. the river, uh, way less tailing loops, way less knots. So to, to not rant for too long, I would suggest looking at uh, finding someone who can teach you well. Um, and uh, you know, your, your, your dad's uncle's Charlie's friend, Bo, who you met once, who fly fished once on a river out east, may not be the best guy to do it because right. he may not have the skills to teach you very well right. as well. So that leads me to my, my I'm going to dumb it down even more from okay. that, from taking a lesson, <clears throat> yeah. is I'm going to recommend that, first of all, you get, need to see if you even enjoy the sport. Yes. So what yes. I would recommend is hire a guide right away, mm -hmm. go out, get those basics while you're on the river, yep. figure out before you invest a single cent. Yep. into a piece of equipment, a fly, a rod, a reel, yep. go out and see if it's something for you. If it's going to be nothing but a bone of contention and frustration for you, you know, it's a learning curve, obviously. But, you know, as soon as you figure out that this is something that you want to do, mm -hmm. then you can go into it. And, yep. and shops like yours that understand that process mm -hmm. are key because you don't have to go out and buy a thousand thousand dollar rod, wrong. right? Yeah. You can come in into a shop and buy a hundred and sixty dollar setup that has you basically ready to go out and fly fish yep. right away, yep. right out of the, right out of the box. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I hate seeing people buy gear they'll never use again. I, I like responsible purchasing uh, and seeing someone who's going to buy the right gear for them and then get into the sport in the right way. Yep. Um, if they come into the shop and demand the best of the best, sure, we're not going to stop you, but we're going to help educate you on like, why well, you may not need that. Um, and then say, do you want a lesson first? Like lots of guys we work with, we, we can teach you as well. See so if you do like it, because if you, you go out there for the first time and you hate it, 
this is not for you. You've now just dumped tons of money to keep us going to sit in the corner. Yeah. That could be better invested in a different sport for your enjoyment elsewhere. So yeah. we're definitely very sensitive to that. We want to make sure that we find the best gear for you um, and that you actually want to do this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so I like getting this question all the time. If you had one setup to take on that desert island or onto that river, oh, you had one setup only, um, what would that setup be and why? And this is uh, Matt from Denver. That is an impossible question. <laughs> that is a tough <laughs> one. Um, I have to, if you have to be a bit more specific in terms of like where to be, say desert island, like an actual desert island, it'd be a different story versus. He, did, he didn't. He didn't indicate. So right, cool. So let's break it down to two. I'd say salt water, and I would say let's do fresh water because okay. there's an easy answer for those. Um, for Salt water, I would definitely be looking at a nine foot nine weight rod. Me too, exactly. That so. does everything from yeah. bone fish, a little heavy for bones, but it'll, it'll do your permit, it'll do barracuda, it'll do a bunch of things like that. It'll be really sporty with a big tarpon too. Very, very, very <laughs> much. You want to break the thing off after a minute or two. Uh, you'll be there for a while. <clears throat> but I would definitely be looking at for freshwater scenarios for what I love to do most, which is bass fishing and trout. Um, it'd be a nine foot six weight or nine foot five weight. It's just the most universal rod there is. Yeah, you know, yeah. with a with a six, you can it can be sporty for northerns. Yeah. Um, but you also have uh, it's a fantastic stick for for um, smallmouth and largemouth bass. Very much so. Yeah. All your trout species. Yep. Very much. Um, so. And walleye. Yep. For those of you for those of you who are getting into walleye fishing, um, you know, a six weight or a, or a or a stiffer five weight rod is is ideal for that with a full sinking. Now yep. there you go with the lines. Is I'm a floating line guy. Yes, me too. For right. a general purpose, do everything line floating first, and then you can always add on different things. Even like a poly leader, which is a sinking tip, you add on to your floating line, yep. turns your floating line into a sinking tip line. Right. So there's a uh, little accessories you can get without going too deep into and in line selection. Um, do talk about technical line selection when I still water fish and compete. Um, I have. At, oh geez, my, my least amount of lines I would have for a day is nine different fly lines to find out where the fish are and target them appropriately. That's going nuts. That's a guy who has a bit of a, a problem, like myself, yeah. with fly fishing, a gear addict, uh, for sure. But you don't need to go that heavy at all. Yeah. Uh, nine foot five weight, nine foot six weight, floating line. Get out there and fish for on nearly everything in fresh water. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then flies. What, what's your... Uh... Ooh, um, for the one fly, uh, the woolly bugger. Yeah. It is a fly that people love to hate and hate to love, much like the pink worm or like mm -hmm. a, a chenille worm. Uh, but that fly will catch you every species, everywhere, um, from permit to bonefish. Uh, if you tie it on a saltwater hook, mind you, um, up to trout, bass, a uh, time big enough, you'll get to sharks. I can guarantee that. It's just a, a really good uh, bait fish or helicromite imitation. Whatever the fish want it to be, it rep represents everything. Right. It's quite good. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So back to that show, mm -hmm. uh, the Maystone. Yes. fly that you're using yep. uh i can't find it anywhere what's up with that ah so the maystone so funny story there it's a it's a personal tie uh, of mine oh it's yours it's mine yeah i invented that fly or just i just adapted a fly pattern into a better use for myself um so if you if you're a fly tire uh it's quite easy it's a it's a it's a pheasant tail nymph uh that's blown out of proportion uh, that's all it is so a super long tail about maybe two to three times not two times the length of the body and the, the, the arms in it are the same as well, like one to two times the length of the body, depending on what you, you have around. Uh, different color thorax, thorax on a, with a tungsten bead and on a caddis curve type hook. And that thing for me has, has been responsible for a lot of fish, like a lot, a lot of fish. Do you sell them here? We don't. We can educate you on how to tie them. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's something we have not got on deck yet for sale in the shop. Uh, gotcha. Depends on how many requests we get, we may start producing those for the shop. Right. Yeah. Well, it did well for you on... Uh on those small streams, didn't it? It did really good. Really good. Actually the credit river locally, um, is a, a small stream, not too far from here. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is a really, really good fly for up there. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of fish, a lot of, upper a, credit. Big, a lot of big fish. Upper credit. <laughs> yeah. Upper credit. Yeah. yeah. I grew up on that river. You did? Yeah. Oh, great. We built a house, uh, when I was 12 years old, built mm -hmm. a house right on the credit. And that's where I taught myself how to fly fish and you did? taught myself more bad habits than anything. <laughs> um, yeah. But I was the kid in, in a pair of shorts and Tevas on the last Saturday in, in April, yeah. freezing my you know what's <laughs> off. But I was after well, those resis, man. Yeah. Oh, and it was oh, yeah. it was a fantastic way to grow up. Yeah. I mean, just just below the falls at the cataract, we, mm, yeah. you know, whether it was summertime or or fishing season, it mm. was it was a, a fantastic way to teach yourselves on, uh, you know, browns and, and rookies and oh, yeah. rainbows. So. Tremendous up there. I love it. It's my yeah. favorite river to fish. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that is a catch and release of single barbless hook uh, regulated. Yes, river absolutely. As well. So every fish you catch, you must put back. Okay. Yeah. Last question of the day. Um, and you and I have discussed this at length. 
uh, in the past because we both love fishing for um, Atlantic salmon, mm -hmm. uh, both in Algoma and uh, out east. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you and I have both had the same experience in fishing Atlantics Ooh, yeah. in that many people, especially in the East, mm -hmm. use a piece of straight shot yes. leader material. Mm -hmm. They do not use tapered leaders. Yes. Um, so typically if you fish Newfoundland, you're going to find uh, 8 to 10 pound single straight shot, 9 to 12 foot of... Uh, off-color green maxima. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's yeah. that's the leader material. Yeah, we go out there with our tapered leaders, yeah. and our and our Newfoundland friends look at us like we're <laughs> crazy. It doesn't work. It right? Doesn't work. Yeah, that's what they say. So, in your opinion, are tapered leaders important, or do you have as much success with a straight shot of let's say one x or two x? So, I believe in physics. Okay. I'm a big fan of looking at science and helping me fish. Yeah. So the way a taper leader uh, works, whether you build one yourself by tying in from like heavier to lighter material or you buy a tapered leader, manufactured extruded leader, is that it goes from a, um, a thin butt, butt section down to a very thin tippet section. Yeah. Um, the idea and, the, and in practice what happens is that thick material transfers energy down the line to your thinner tippet material. So you get a way, way, way better turnover. Yeah. Absolutely better turnover. So for myself, I, I like turning a flyover. I know what's happening with it. It's going to swim right away. I'm in touch with what happens there um, at the end of my fly. Because you could have a fly hit the water with a lot of slack and a, a fly that's not well turned over. A fish can grab it and let it go before you even know the fish was even there. So for the for the use of a taper leader, absolutely, it gets things turned over perfectly. If you're if, if you have a good cast, then it's going to start fishing right away. So what about windy conditions, though? I um, mean, because I, yeah. I I prefer I personally I like to to use um, a straight shot piece of you know one X mono mm -hmm. when yep. I'm fishing for bass. Yes, because with fishing bigger poppers in the wind, mm -hmm. I find that that straight shot has a better turnover rate. Oh yeah, I, I still go with uh, taper leaders on those. Yeah, yeah okay. just for me, it's easy. It's it's a it's a solution that I I just, I've always gone to. Yeah. Um, the, a funny story was up. I was up in Labrador fishing the Hunt River, and one of my guides um, on a very windy day had a big, big bomber on my line, and he had a was about twelve. Oh, it was about twelve feet of eight pounds uh, chameleon maxima. Yeah. He's like, all right, boy, I just cast up there, hit that rock, and I was trying my darn to Steve. But with like howling winds, there wasn't enough backbone in my <clears throat> in my uh, in my my leader to actually turn that fly over. Mm -hmm. So I said, look, stop! I can't do this. I actually just cannot do this. So I clipped off my the. Uh, the leader, the Maxima, put on a taper leader and made that shot and actually hooked the fish. Right. I sat there with the guy and the guy was like, well, that was a good idea. <laughs> and yeah. I, I wonder if he fishes tapers, tapered leaders now. <laughs> he might after that, yeah. Well, that's the thing about tapered leaders too is that they're very buildable. You can yes. build them, you, you know, sitting at home, tying flies or watching a football game or something. Yeah. It's it's no-brainer to... Yeah. to uh, to whip together a bunch of leaders in no time flat. Oh yeah, there's a ton of um, recipes online depending on what you want to do. Dry flies, nymphs, um, streamers, you name it. So there are recipes out there. You will easily Google um, leader building recipes for yeah. fly fishing and you'll find them. Yeah, well that was from, that question was from Andrew from Delaware. Andrew, thank you for that. Appreciate it very much. Um, a couple of uh, administrative items that I'd like to get out there is, again, I want to know what you guys want with respect to when these should air, whether it's should be Monday, on the weekend, on Wednesdays. I'm thinking Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. I think you're yep. right. Um, coming up on the new Fly Fisher, we have two fantastic big pike shows coming up. This weekend, we're in northern Saskatchewan fishing uh, Milton Lake Lodge. Um, and then the following weekend, we're up in northern Ontario, in northwestern Ontario, Sunset Country, um, fishing giant northern pike out of Strikers Point Lodge in the fall. This is a September show, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to be up there to host it. Uh, and I caught and released my largest northern pike to date. Amazing. Um, so check it out. It's well over 40 inches, well over 40 inches, um, eight right at the boat. It's a fantastic show. Uh, so please check that out. Uh, and don't forget, on the new Fly Fisher Facebook page, uh, you can enter the Algoma That Big contest. It is a fantastic contest. All you need to do is upload your pictures of your big fish caught in the last calendar year in North America, uh, and you're entered to win uh, fantastic Yeti gear, a GoPro 7, oh. um, uh, a Yeti Panga backpack, which is arguably the most durable backpack I've ever used. Uh, fantastic stuff. So um, go to the Algoma website at www.algomacountry.com or the Facebook page 
and uh, you guys can enter to win today. And there's monthly prizes as well. Cool, solid. All yeah. right. There's one quick little thing if I can jump in. Absolutely. We are hosting a online river cleanup contest. So how it oh, works? This is great. You did this last year. We did. Yeah, it's called uh, "Take This Bag and Stuff It." Um, so what it is? It's a um, a number that we give you, and we can give you the bag and glove and paper piece of paper in the shop, or we can email it to you as well with the number and how you enter. Um, and what we want you to do is go to the river or um, or the bank of a stream or wherever you may be, clean up some garbage and send us a photo of the bag with the garbage with the number that we give you. Um, so it's entered into a draw and you can win a prize. Cool. The prize is to be determined yet, but it's a good way to get everyone thinking about everyday stewardship of their local waters. Yeah, I always carry a bag with me when I go yeah. on, on the rivers and often carry out a lot more than I bring in. Yep. So right that's on. good. Perfect. All right, everybody, thank you for watching. Stay tuned to the new Fly Fisher on TV, on the internet, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel at the new Fly Fisher TV. Um, every episode that we shot last season and multiple seasons in the past gets uploaded every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time, and I'll be on there for a live chat as well. So, from Facebook land, thanks for watching. Rob, thanks very much, man. Drift thank is you. an awesome shop. Come on down to Toronto, check it out.